Hello, everybody. Uh, thank you to all of those who have joined the call um, and welcome to our third Afterthoughts event in our PGR and ECR series of events as part of the Careers Week. Um, these events have been designed and delivered by the Universities of Leeds, Sheffield and York in partnership with the White Rose GTP uh, and they are funded by the ESRC. Quite a few nice acronym, acronyms for you all there. Um, before I introduce our speaker and before we get started, um, there are a couple of housekeeping things I'd like to cover off. Um, first off, you'll see there are some captions at the bottom of your um, screen. If you do want to turn these off, I believe you can either hover over them or there is a live transcript button at the bottom. So you can click on those to remove. Um, I also wanted to mention that we have had a few pre-submitted questions already. So thank you very much um, for those. But you're also very welcome to submit questions throughout the discussion. So feel free to do that using the Q&A function. Uh, and you can do that whenever that question pops to mind. So while we'll probably be looking to cover them at the end of the discussion, do pop them in that box and, and we'll be monitoring it throughout. Um, we also have the chat function. So if you have any issues uh, and you, you have any tech issues or anything like that you think we can help with, then just pop that in the chat box and um, we will get back to you as we do have people monitoring that. Um, in terms of the format, um, we're going to keep it to uh, an informal discussion between myself and Callum. There's some key questions that we want to cover off and, and uh, we want to certainly know about Callum's career um, progression and, and what he does at the moment. Um, and then we're going to open up to the Q&A, as I mentioned. Um, before I introduce Callum, there's one other person I'd like to introduce. Um, if you were on yesterday's Afterthoughts, you will have already met Laura, uh, one of our wonderful speakers yesterday, or our wonderful speaker yesterday. And Laura was also on the line on uh, Monday to live scribe um, our Afterthought session, which she's going to be doing here again for Callum. Um, so you'll see these beautiful illustrations emerging as we discuss, and then I will introduce Laura at the end um, and she's going to just kind of summarise what it is she's um, she's illustrated for us. So I'm going to kick things off. Um, thank you to everyone who's joined. Um, I'm going to introduce our speaker today. So I'll introduce Callum Patterson. Uh, Callum, following a degree in economics and economic history at the University of York, is now working as principal at um, FMA Partners, a company that is changing governments around the world. So hopefully we're going to hear a lot more about that. So um, Callum, if you want to unmute um, yourself and, and turn on your video, we can all say hello. Hi Alexander, uh, hopefully you can hear me. Um, unfortunately, it's not allowing me to turn my video off. On, oh, um, <laughs> okay. Uh, we've got AV on the line, so the hopefully, it, unfortunately. <laughs> so yeah. hopefully, if AV are on the line and can help, there we go. Oh, yeah. brilliant! There we go. We need to be able to see you. <laughs> yeah. right. um, welcome, Callum. Thank you so much for for joining us for Afterthoughts. It's great to have you. My pleasure. Um, I'm going to kick off with with a bit of um, a disclosure, really, about why we wanted to to invite you to our Afterthought series. Um, because obviously these events are are promoted to our PhD and early career researchers across the White Rose universities. And, and while obviously that, that isn't your higher education journey, I think we found so um, interesting about your current role is that you are kind of existing in that intersection between working for the private sector, but then also working with, with the public sector policymakers and, and sort of influencing um, governments and, and policies around the world. And so really, it would be brilliant to just kick off with a bit more of an understanding about what you do, who you work for, um, and whether I'm right in saying that you kind of exist in that intersection, because that may not be the case at all. So it'd be just brilliant to hear your views on that. Sure. Um... So yeah, you're right. I left the university after my bachelor's degree at the University of York, and I kind of stumbled into what I do now, which is uh, procurement consulting. So um, for most, when I try to explain procurement to people, I usually call it a sort of a deal-making function. And you know, we sit at the intersection of buyers and suppliers to make sure that that arrangement and the deal that's made at that point works out for both parties, although usually representing the, the buyer side of things predominantly. And I, I fell into that role as so I got a graduate scheme with Jaguar Land Rover, uh, where I was essentially buying car parts for them, uh, working with a range of suppliers, mainly from Eastern Europe and Asia. And so sort of my role there was just you know, negotiating contracts and developing suppliers so they could improve their quality and build a relationship with them. 
but it meant I got to travel quite a bit, visiting factories and visiting supply headquarters to have various discussions and things. So I started out very much in the private sector. Built on that then as I, as I was enjoying that role, I went into more of a consulting element of procurement. So working for a consulting firm with clients in the private sector mm. on more organizational transformational work within the procurement sector still. Yeah. And that then led me to where I am today, which, like you said, is a sort of intersection of private and public, because I, I swapped from a private consultancy into a, well, a private consultancy that works for public sector clients. So right. we do procurement consulting for governments, essentially, um, or foreign governments. We don't work for the UK government, but we are based in London. And yeah, it, it's a a fascinating intersection of helping with significant government either transformational projects or spending projects to help them realize the maximum potential value out of their procurement initiatives so whether that's making sure they spend the money effectively or get the the best quality and the best results and the best impact for you know every dollar spent yeah um, and, and we particularly work with developing countries because they're usually the ones most in need of these sort of services so it's a uh, it's a fun job of trying to help develop a country through its government expenditure and help you know, deliver infrastructure projects and services for the people. Fascinating. And it's really interesting to, like you say, to intersect those two different worlds and those two different roles. And I'd be interested to understand from you whether you feel there are big stark differences in those two environments, those two sectors, or actually whether you feel that you, you know, it's it's quite similar this role and your mm. relationships with your clients now are very similar to say the relationship that you had with your clients at Jaguar Land Rover. Sure um yeah it's interesting so I think it, within procurement anyway there's a, a very stark difference between private sector and public sector mm. uh, and I think the same is really true for any sort of function that splits between the two um in the it's so in the private sector things in my mind are quite simple it comes down to the profit and whether or not what you're doing will be able to deliver a profit for the company, be that short term or more of a long term initiative of building up the customer base, delivering better quality that therefore generates more customers. Whereas um, moving over to the public sector, it's never quite as, as clear cut, I'd say, uh, especially in the, the world where we work, where it's uh, more developing economies and perhaps not with as robust uh, sort of civil service institutions mm -hmm. uh, and with um, I'll try and say this delicately more political influence over some of the decisions that are being made um, yeah. and yeah. by that I mean you know you, you might have a, a decision that financially might not hold true um, but there are certain political influences at play be they domestic or international that mean that the, the decision makers at the end of the day you know, the, the ministers and the governments want to move forwards with that decision yes. nonetheless and that's really interesting and I, I imagine as an organization it's really interesting then the clients that you choose to work with or you have the opportunity to work with and um does the company do you have do you have much of a say over that or do you um have any influence I guess over any of the sort of decisions that are made I know that you mentioned it was a very sensitive thing to talk about but um and I know there's only so much you can say, but I just think it's it's really interesting piece to sort of say, you know, how how do kind of values and ethics of the organisation and of yourself kind of fit into some of the decision making process? Yeah, of course. Um, so at the end of the day, we you know, we advise on government reform, and uh, mm. so we only really work with clients that we believe are interested in reform. And um, so that I mean, you know, there there are certain governments in the world uh, that we wouldn't necessarily want to work with because of their, their track record of reform and current political climate in the countries. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, we, we do focus on that um, and we do take conscious choices to work with certain clients and, and not work with others. Um, but you know, like any sort of sales organization at the end of the day, you don't get to choose the clients always. Uh, and just because we want to work with them doesn't mean that we do work with all of the, the best and the greatest governments in the world. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's why it's so interesting what you do, and I think particularly to probably the participants that the attendees we have on the call, sorry, who are probably, you know, 
our social science researchers are often doing a lot of work, which means that they are looking to lobby governments and influence policy change. I think this is a really, really interesting talk um, in terms of seeing that there are roles and there are um, opportunities to do that beyond um, academia. <laughs> Also interested to, to understand whether you yourself or FMA um, has any relationships with any sort of think tanks, research organisations or academic institutions, for example, or whether it's very much more about just delivering on the, the project um, that your client has kind of come to you with. Yeah, um, so we don't necessarily have any formal relationships and you know, we are uh, we, we sort of compete in a way with some certain think tanks and lobby groups um, on the work that we do, but more of the sort of international policy side of things that so we will work with governments that are part of, of policy initiatives in the UK. And we, we might sometimes support initiatives that are from the UK working in foreign governments. Um, but generally, we don't have formal relationships with them. Um, mm -hmm. What yeah. we do do is so when we are working with governments, when we need like policy advice, or we're looking to understand the best approach to take. We have a, a group of uh, senior advisors that we call on. Um, and you'll see from our website, it, it's quite a quite an impressive list of former MPs uh, and members of the House of Lords that we have as part of our senior advisors team. And yeah. they'll be the people giving us uh, the advice on which approach to take and what route to go forwards with. Yeah, it's really interesting. And, and is that... Um, I mean, from your perspective, obviously, you started out um, in the sector at, at car manufacturing company, J, J, Jaguar Land Rover. Is this um, ending up in kind of this world where you are working with advisory groups that are made up of MPs and uh, House of Lords, for example? Is, is this something that you deliberately kind of moved into? And are you comfortable in that environment? And so you did it deliberately or, or was it just kind of a career progression that happened? Um, yeah, I'd love to tell you that it's all part of a grand strategic plan. Um, <laughs> But as I alluded to already, I, I tend to sort of take the opportunities as they come up. Um, and this opportunity came up for me. I, I answered a phone at seven o'clock in the morning when I was half asleep. And then actually it was a recruiter with quite an interesting proposition uh, mm. for a role to take. So these things do just come up sometimes. And for me, it, it's something that I was keen to do because um, when I was at York studying economics and economic history, I, I was specialising in the modules more related to international development. Um, and yeah. then I said I sort of fell into procurement. So this is kind of a nice full circle path of yeah. bringing back what I learned in procurement to international development uh, and working on policy and projects that could benefit um, the economic development of some of our clients. So. It sat really nicely for me, but it was just something that, that came across my lap one day and I thought it was too good not to, to take. No, absolutely. I, th I really like um, what you said about kind of coming full circle as well a little bit with, with it bringing in your international development um, interests and the work that you did as part of your undergraduate degree. And do you find that it's, has it kind of piqued your interest in that kind of world of kind of you know policy reform government reform things is it kind of something that therefore now you you would be keen to exist in that world or keen to yeah continue progression in this field yeah definitely um there are some things about the private sector that i miss um it's sometimes a little bit easier to do things in the private sector than in the public <laughs> sector just because you've got more more eyes and more transparency over it but uh yeah it's definitely something that uh piqued my interest it's kind of a a push pull a little bit because now I'm surrounded by people who are really passionate about it. You can't help but just absorb more information and get involved in the debate a little bit more than you would have otherwise. Yeah. Um, you know, and like I said, yeah, it's a really interesting team of people we get to work with, and it, it's still a relatively small organisation, and um, so it is quite a lot of direct contact with some of these senior advisors. So you can't help but getting more involved in in the whole sort of politics of it and the getting interested in the topic as, as a whole beyond just what you do with your client. Yeah, absolutely. I can, ima I can imagine. Um, and do you feel then that you use a lot of the same skills um, that you kind of learned in your kind of higher education journey, but also in your kind of career progression through the private sector? Or have you really had to pick up different skills working now in quite a different area with different clients from a different sector? No, there's definitely some skills that, that go through throughout, I'd say. Um, 
now from the, the international development stuff that I studied at university that obviously helps at the moment for me to understand some of the context and just yeah. put some of our decisions into a wider picture and understanding of that and um, I, I always look at procurement there's sort of two ways you can look at it there's the, the contracts and the financials and the more sort of facts and figures side of it but there's also a lot of it to do with sort of the art of creating the deals and negotiating and at the end of the day it's about two sides that are usually represented by two people coming together in agreement and a lot of that I tie back to the sort of behavioral economics topics that we studied at university and and then since then just understanding of people and it, it's more the psychological side of it to more the, the social side of it trying to understand what people's uh, objectives and sort of driving factors are behind the decisions and the statements they're making and I think that's got even more important now in my more recent role because when you're working with sort of ministers and government you know they have drivers that you know, aren't always necessarily clear they're not based on facts and figures you know they yeah. want to choose certain things for their their party or for their own political careers that you have to sort of understand and get your head around it's it's not written down on paper it's more the psychological side of things yeah absolutely and and do you get much exposure to the clients that you work with i mean are you, are you working with them daily and are you i know you recently and when we spoke were um working abroad so obviously mm -hmm. national travel so are yeah. you spending a lot of time immersing yourself in your clients environment yeah but certainly um because it's been part of my role ever since i left university really and i remember uh, so i left the first week of our graduate training at jlr I was met by my manager and one of the first questions she asked is, you know, do you have a passport? And the next week we were off to, I think it was Malta that week for a, a supplier visit. And ever since it's been a, a case of sort of regular travel, uh, especially as a consultant, you, you're expected yeah. to travel quite frequently. Um, and that was usually a sort of a once a week to Europe and, and back to London for the weekends. And now, yeah, in the current role, like I said, it's all foreign governments. So the, the clients are away and in my role as a principal, Part of that is managing the client relationships and managing the, the work and the teams that we have. So I, um, but well, when COVID's not getting in the way, the, the schedule is usually sort of half my time's here in London and half my time is abroad uh, working with clients. Uh, so yeah, you do get quite a lot of that face time and quite a lot of exposure to different cultures, different ways of working. And mm -hmm. as we're working with government, you're sort of at the heart of it as well. It, you go right into the middle of the way things work in that country and in that organization so you do get a lot of interesting exposure to international environments i can imagine i can imagine you're right in the thick of it really you get a real deep understanding of of that that country and how it's run and the challenges and the opportunities yeah most definitely yeah and, and how do you find all that inter international travel is it um, yeah, it, it, relish or <laughs> It, it, it changes depending on the, the patterns at the time, I'd say, to be honest. It's, uh, it does make your job more of a lifestyle choice than just a career choice, because uh, yeah. it's, it's not like at five o'clock, you just clock off and you can go for go meet up with a friend or you know go and sit on the couch at home. You are still there and you, you're not home that evening. Yeah. And yes, yeah, so it, it kind of more of a lifestyle, but I try and make the most of it and try and, you know, if it means I'm, going somewhere for business, maybe stay for the weekend or, you know, have my partner fly out or visit friends that live nearby and just yeah, make the most out of it. And then it has great opportunities, um, but it's not yeah. for everyone. Uh, it won't be for me forever, but for the time being, I, I really enjoy it. That's brilliant. And I think you mentioned, and we've mentioned a few times your role, your title being principal. Um, mm. And I mean, personally, it's not sort of a, a job title that I'd come across before. So it'd just be interesting again to understand a little bit more about what that that means and and the role yeah. and the responsibility that you have yeah uh and to be honest this is a job title that i absolutely hate because uh, no one knows what it means <laughs> um even when i go on linkedin now i'll be recommended jobs for being a headmaster of a school or something yeah. like that so yeah uh it is a term that's used more often in consulting um, than anywhere else that i know of uh, and it generally refers to a sort of senior manager level person within the organization um, so as part of that role as I sort of said do it. it's managing client relationships you won't be owning the client relationship as we tend to refer to it so sort of the most senior person but you'll be managing on a day-to-day -day basis and you'll be managing teams we have associates and analysts in the team that are 
sort of project manage on a day-to-day -day basis to assign work to and make sure we're delivering things. So you know, I spend most of my time either talking to clients, attending meetings, or reviewing work that the team has done before it gets sent out the door. Yeah. Um, yeah. So you really are you're responsible for that relationship and also for management of people within your team. Yeah, and, and yeah most definitely, yeah. And I think the role varies depending on where you go, but generally within a consulting organization, um, you, know, you start off as a sort of associate level where you'd expect to interact with the client but not manage the relationship. Yeah. And then quite quickly, organizations tend to let you have more and more of that exposure to the client. So it's something that I suggest to anyone that's listening now, if they are interested in consulting, really look for organizations that let you have that exposure because those are the sort of ones that would foster the, the sort of environment and culture that lets you be free to do what you think is best and give you some autonomy in your role. Yeah, and I guess that links into one of the pre-submit questions that we that we had around the opportunities and prospects mm -hmm. for an international student of your team. So, I mean, what's the organization and size is it something that's fairly small are you growing is it you know are there opportunities for, for some yeah, of our yeah. attendees so it is relatively small uh, it was founded in 2016 but really grown quite a bit over the last couple of years and uh, i think we're now at around 35 or so roughly um and the the growth usually comes through through new clients and new works that we're doing so it does go in phases but we are continuously looking for new members of the team uh, and most of our, our hires are actually international students or were international students um, we hire at an analyst level for people coming straight out of a, a master's degree uh, and then it goes into an associate level above that for people with a little bit more experience um, but yeah, we are we are hiring. There are opportunities, um, and you can visit the website. It's fma.com, and then there's a whole section on there about careers. There we go. Hopefully, that answers the question very uh, very attractively to whoever submitted that. So <laughs> that's brilliant to know. Um, and actually, when you touched upon kind of you know associate level for for those graduating with a master's or or um, higher, sorry, if it wasn't associate, but you know the opportunities really for masters and beyond, but. Um, Thinking about kind of who else you work with, I know you've also touched upon the fact that, you know, the senior advisors are, are often MPs and people who, who work in politics, but what are the other sort of backgrounds of, of the people who you work with? Sure, so I mean, it helps if go top down, if that was sort of explain it to you. So, um, yeah, cause... so the organization uh, was founded by uh, Francis Maud, uh, hence the F and the M and, um, a lady called uh, Simone Finn, uh, who together ran what was called the Efficiency Reform Group, which was a UK civil service reform program mm -hmm. run under uh, David Cameron's government at the time that delivered uh, billions of pounds worth of savings to the operational costs of the civil service um, through things like procurement reform. Uh, digital reform. So I'm sure you've all been on like gov.uk recently, that that was one of the outcomes of this. Before mm -hmm. that, all the different government departments had their own websites. And this just sort of consolidated really the, the IT infrastructure around all that. So they did that, uh, left government uh, and have now gone to set up their own consultancy, which is FMA. Um, although recently someone has actually taken a leave from FMA to go work as a deputy chief of staff to Boris Johnson. So she's gone back into politics again. Um, but then below that, we have the senior advisors. So a number of former MPs, uh, members of cabinet. And then below that, we have our sort of director team. So our managing directors who are predominantly ex-civil servants themselves who have come out from senior positions in the civil service uh, to work at FMA. And then below that, we have principals like myself, uh, who generally specialize in certain aspects of the work that we do. So I do procurement reform. We have uh, another two that work on financial management reform. So that's another sort of service that we offer our clients. And then we have our associates and analysts. So an, an associate for us is either someone that joined us as an analyst for a couple of years and has demonstrated that they're sort of working at a level above that, or they're people that have come out 
from uh, other organizations. Maybe they've been working in a think tank or a lobby group yeah. uh, and have experience in their, their field. And then uh, an analyst, like I said, is our sort of entry level position, which is predominantly master's students. Um, we hire kind of a lot from, from Oxbridge, but we do hire from elsewhere as well. Yeah, we well, really do exist very much in that kind of political sphere, <laughs> particularly as the, mm. as you say, the founders were so involved in government and civil service and now are back doing lots of those roles. So I guess it's very much, yeah, at the heart of what FMA do. And um, it yeah, yeah. It, must, it must be a big shift for, for you of, of kind of being not in that environment at all and then moving into it. It is, yeah. I, I was never really interested in politics that much, to be perfectly <laughs> honest. Uh, I've kind of had to get a little bit more interested now, but yeah, yeah. It, it is. It's an interesting environment. I think you know, we're, we're trying to build an organization that sort of takes the best of both worlds. Um, yeah. Does away with some of the bureaucracy of working in the public sector uh, and mm -hmm. bring some of the sort of agile methods of the private sector and the ability to move a little bit faster uh, without yeah. hierarchy and bureaucracy. So hopefully guess, it comes off. Which I guess positions you perfectly because you have experience now of both of those worlds. So exactly. You, in, yeah kind of what what you learn and the processes and and the way that you did things when you were at kind of places like Jaguar Land Rover and then now you've got all of that awareness about politics and how things work in that and mm -hmm. um, what would you say um you enjoy most about your role um so I think for me it's a lot of it comes down to the variety and, and this is something that sort of holds true throughout my career is um I wish there was a, a more structured way of saying this, but I get bored quite easily. Uh, and I really look for roles that give me that variety to carry on learning. Uh, it, it's crucially important for me that I do always have a role that I feel challenged by and that I'm learning continuously. And the variety that you get in a role like this um, is just phenomenal. Um, and there are some weeks where it's just a bit flabbergasting, to be honest, the, the different things you end up working on because yeah. you are at the heart of not just one but a few governments at any one point in time are working on different projects the the type of issues that they're trying to tackle at any one point in time can be completely different and quite from a vast yeah. range of different topics yeah. but even at a tactical level the type of projects you get involved in you know, whether it's healthcare whether it's uh, infrastructure projects whether it's uh, waste management, all sorts of variety of different things that you can get involved in. And each of those requires, well, it's very rare that I come across something that I've done before. So yeah. a lot of the time you end up having to completely research you know, what, what is this entire sector about? What drives it? What are its key factors that we need to consider? What are the potential benefits? You know, and a lot of it usually comes down to looking at proposals and contracts and, and suppliers and trying to understand are we doing this the right way? Are we going about it in the right way? What is the best way to do this? And mm. that often involves quite a lot of research uh, every time you start a new project. Yeah, you can imagine. And I mean, are you able to give us an example? Like you, you picked up on some really interesting things there, whether it's kind of, you know, healthcare, waste management, infrastructure, you know, is there a particular example um, of the type of work that you may have done in one of those areas for a particular government? I mean, I understand you yeah. want probably into too much detail, but I think to just give us a bit of a flavour of, of... Of course, of course. Okay. So one of the things we're being asked um, quite a few times at the moment is obviously around healthcare expenditure, because that's a big topic for everyone at the moment. And Well, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so uh, we were doing a lot of work in that sector around reviewing um, the way in which governments and public healthcare systems are buying their their medicines and their protective equipment okay. and just general yeah. expenditure okay. uh, to mm -hmm. look for opportunities to deliver um, better what we call category strategies so in mm -hmm. procurement we talk a lot about categories and those are kind of the types of things you spend your money on yeah. so at the very high level uh, in procurement we have indirect and direct and the direct is kind of the stuff that would go into a product so if you're building a car, the steering wheel is a direct component of that. If you're building a car, the, uh, the cleaners that clean the factory, that's indirect. They okay. don't go into yeah. part of the car. So yeah. we deal with those sort of two categories quite a lot. And then within the indirect, you have a whole range of different things like HR, marketing, IT. Those are all categories of things. 
Mm. So um, what we do a lot for our clients at the moment is looking at where they're spending their money in these different categories and trying to recommend better strategies for managing that. But the strategies you know, vary quite a lot depending on the categories. You, know, you wouldn't manage a cleaner the same way you'd manage how you buy your medicines. The, the right. to, you manage very differently in the different things yeah. affecting the market being international or domestic regulations and laws and that's what we have to research every time um, around how we can develop that so that they're spending the money on on the best things possible and getting as much as they can for their money mm, yeah and do you i mean this might be um a strange question to ask you but i just wonder if um you know if emotions ever came into any of that because you must encounter some some fairly unusual or difficult decisions that have been made potentially in a in in a government in a particular country that you're working in or, or am I completely wrong in that and there's there's not you know you don't get to see the kind of I'm just thinking about the work that you do and often the the impact that that might have on on citizens of that, that um that government that you're working for it, is there much of a connect between that or is it actually you know you're quite distant from that and therefore it it doesn't kind of take an emotional toll on you at any point no there are there are certain projects that i think do more of it than others you know like referring to healthcare is one of them mm, um, yeah i think if anything it's more of an emotional drive to want to do better because most of our clients you know, they pay us to give them advice so it's rare that they hear our advice and go, thank you, but no, thank you. Uh, usually they want to do things better uh, and that's why we're there and that's why they're paying us. Yeah. Um, but if anything else, things like this, you know, they do, the emotions drive you to want to do it more and want to do better and want to find the best solutions possible because a lot of our clients, you know, they aren't particularly liquid at the moment. So you know, every penny counts and it's really important for us to help them with that and to help them yeah. deliver results because you know it can make a difference yeah well that's that's really interesting and it's great that you're actually in a position where the the emotional side of it can actually drive you to want to do better and, and yeah. do the best by your clients so that's it's great that you're able to to take that from your role because i think that's quite important to a lot of the the attendees on today's call in these positions and social science research is often you are looking for for a way of kind of impact through the research that you're doing so it's it's great that you're having that impact through the work that you're doing. Yeah. Um, and I would say that you know, the public sector, I think gives you that more than the private sector ever would. And um, mm. there are obviously organizations in the private sector that have more of an impact than others. But yeah. as a whole, I'd say the public sector gets, does get you that closer connect with having an impact on people's lives and for the benefit of people. Yeah, and that's certainly what, what we find, I think, particularly in, in our roles, organising these types of things is, is we want to often showcase opportunities beyond kind of um, academia or third or public sector sometimes that can have an, a positive impact. So I think, you know, real reason why we wanted to, to talk to you, because you actually showcase one of those opportunities that your clients are the public sector, but you're actually working for a private sector organisation. Yeah. while still has a, a massive kind of exists in that sphere of politics as we discussed but it just showcases the different kind of opportunities out there I think and, and the different kind of organizations that exist and um, I guess on that I asked you what you enjoy most and um, what what do you in what do you least like about your role <laughs> um, and we won't tell your employers <laughs> no no um, I'll be honest with them I'm, I, I tell them every day um, <laughs> I say it, some of it does sometimes come down to the travel side of it. There are, mm. it comes in ups and downs, um, but it is like a more of a lifestyle. And sometimes the work commitments don't always suit the lifestyle. So, you know, I'm, I'm never happy when I'm getting up at 3 a.m. for a flight or, yeah. or taking a, an overnight flight back home again to have a meeting two hours after I land. It's, it can take its toll, uh, yeah. but you, there are ways to compensate for it, like I said. And uh, the company is usually pretty uh, uh, adaptive at sort of helping you manage the times that you have for travel and the workload around that. So it's not all bad, but it has its yeah. moments. I can imagine. And uh, particularly at the moment with having to then add in quarantine into the mix. <laughs> yes, yes, it all comes a lot more complicated, a lot more yeah. busy paper you have to carry with you. And do you think would travel be um, as you progress through the company? Would would is travel a feature of all roles within the organisation? 
Um, yes, that is the easy answer. Yeah. Uh, you get a little bit more control over when and where you travel as you go up the ranks, for sure. Um, but well, uh, consulting organizations that, that serve international clients that will always have, I think, a feature of travel. Um, yeah. and we, our clients, because of where they are and the, some of the infrastructure where they are, they're not uh, as advanced with remote working as you get in the UK. Uh, or other parts of the Western world. So face-to-face uh, -face is still a big part of that. So therefore travel is still gonna be a big part of our role. Yeah. Um, you know, before I left the private sector, you know, we were seeing, especially when COVID hit, a lot of our clients moving to more remote services. So I can see that being less of a part of the, the role in a private sector consultancy. Mm. Uh, and you also have some consultancies that structure themselves around a local model. So by that, I mean, you'd have, say you had a client in Germany, you'd have a team that based in Germany rather than expecting people to fly all around Europe. So there are, it does vary. Um, but for us, I think travel will always be a part of the role. Yeah. And um, before we move on to Q&A, um, so anyone listening invite you to, to add questions into the box if you, if you have any, um, what sort of advice would you give to your younger self? And, and also on that, I guess, talking about what advice you give to yourself, sort of any advice to those on the line as well who might be looking to pursue a career similar to, to that that you have? Sure, sure. Um, so I think one thing that really was sticks in my head when people asked me this was uh, a conversation I had with one of my former managers um, whilst we were on a business trip, as it happens, um, about what I should do in my career that I kind of rebelled against and I'm quite thankful that I did. And you, know, you will go into organizations that have certain time frames for how things should work and how things should happen. So, you know, whether it's typical you get promoted every three years or four years, or, you know, you have to be around for 10 years before you reach a certain level. And, and my advice is, is don't let anyone else prescribe to you how long you need to be in a role and what you need to be doing if you feel like you're not developing like your time is the most valuable thing to mm. use you won't be able to get change that so always make the most use of your time and for me that meant when i knew that i wasn't developing anymore and i was just coasting even if it was coasting towards a promotion if i wasn't actually developing myself it was time to leave and i took that choice and, and left and yeah. uh, I'm very grateful I did because it led me to new places to do new things and mm -hmm. uh, I've mm -hmm. never regretted those choices. Yeah, that, that's really important. I love, you know, love you saying time is the most valuable thing for you. It's, it's true, it's totally true. Um, and so on that, would you, that would be the advice you would give to some of our researchers who might be interested in this sort of career is, you know, look at the opportunities out there and... Exactly, unless you, you, your researchers are listening, uh, are really enjoying what they're doing right now don't wait because time will pass and uh you know, there will be other people making the most out of their time so it's best that you make the most out of yours too yeah brilliant thank you so i think we'll move on to some of the questions um i think we've have let me have a look at the q a because we haven't got anything new come in but we have got a couple of pre-submitted questions um I know one of the some of the, one of them uh, we've kind of covered where we talked about you know interesting case studies on government's decision. I think you, you picked up a bit on that actually um, when you you know gave gave as an example of the sort of healthcare procurement work that you're doing. Um, there was another question around the the plan for Nigeria and other African countries as replicating the impact on the UK civil service. Mm -hmm. Is there anything you can you can say on that or is it a bit tricky to answer yeah i'll, I'll avoid saying anything too specific but <laughs> um yeah i think there's definitely a market for what we do uh in africa and i think that there are well i know there are other organizations that are selling mm -hmm. similar services to what we do uh, at the moment it's not something that i believe we will be doing in the near future um, mm -hmm. But I think it's definitely a, a market to keep an eye on. Great, thank you. Um, if anyone has any more questions, please do feel free to to pop them in the box. Um, 
otherwise I think you know what we'll do Callum unless there's anything else you want to add is sort of wrap up I know we're slightly ahead of time but um I think it's been really interesting and I think we've focused on exactly what it is I think will hopefully be irrelevant to the attendees on the call which is around yeah your role at the intersection of all these different sectors mm -hmm. and uh, and how you navigate that um I think you know just just to wrap up um I guess it'd be really interesting to hear from you. I know we sort of asked or advice you give to your younger self, but I think what is there that you're also proud of um, in your career? And, you know, what uh, what would you potentially change? Oh, okay, that's a tough one. Um, <laughs> I know, it's put you on the spot, but the last question. <laughs> yeah, I guess what I'm proud of uh, would be, it's less of a career, more of a life thing. It's just how far I've come because when I was, yeah, I could come back into personal life here, but when I, I grew up on a farm in West Wales, um, going to a, you know, a local school that was about 300 people, the sort of opportunity that I have now was never presented to me as something that was open for me. Yeah. Um, and the only reason I've got there is just because I said, you know, just don't waste your time, just take the opportunities if they come up. Don't let other people prescribe to you what your career path should be and that you should sit in a certain box and wait or that you know you should ex be happy with what you have if you're not happy with it look for something else and keep looking until you're happy um so i'm quite proud that you know i've come as far as i have uh, and uh, like I said, i've never regretted the moves that i've made so mm. that's what i'm most proud of um would i change anything not really no um uh, i do i think i made the right choices at the right time now looking back um, it hasn't always felt like it was the right choice, but I think there's always taught me things along the way of sort of driving me towards what I'm more interested in. Sometimes doing something that's maybe not what you enjoy perfectly helps you to find what you want to do next. Yeah. Um, so it hasn't always been, you know, the perfect path of more and more happiness as I go. There have been moments where I've doubted myself. Um, but what I always used to say to people when they ask me, sort of, you know, would I change my mind about where I work or what I do is I've never looked back. I occasionally look sideways, but I've never looked back. Mm, I like it. <laughs> That's brilliant. Thank you so much, Callum. Thank you. You know, you should be proud. It's a really interesting career that you've carved out for yourself. And um, I think it just showcases what fascinating roles there are out there and also speaks to the impact piece, which I think will really resonate with the researchers that we have on the call because mm you know, of the drivers for doing research, particularly with social scientists, is to have that impact out in the real world. And um, so, you know, I think it's fascinating that you're showcasing that, that you're doing that through the work that you're, that you're currently, you're doing at FMA. So thank you so much. Um, you. Before you leave us and before everybody else leaves us, I'd love to hang over to, um, to Laura, who I don't think you had the screen on, Callum, did you? Because you didn't want to be distracted. So no, I haven't. I've seen it yet. Yeah. And you can see Laura's amazing work because she's been um, illustrating, scribing away as we've been talking. So, um, Laura, do you, do you want to come in now? Hello, everybody. Yes, more than happy. I will get rid of my face so you can just see uh, Callum's lovely face and everything you were talking about. So if we start in the bottom left, um, Callum talks to us about his role as a procurement consultant, which is as, as sexy as it sounds, I found, um, with kind of the, looking at the deal making um, and the economic uh, relationships between different organisations um, and that he works at the intersection of the private and the public sectors as a private sector company working with public sector organisations and foreign governments in particular and highlighted the difference between uh, the private and the public sector and I've kind of summarised it as profit versus politics as, a, as the difference between the two. Um, talked about working with senior advisors to make decisions, some of whom are MPs and I also liked that Callum kind of pointed out that the role he's in now, there was an element of luck in, in getting there because it was it was just a phone call that came through that he wasn't expecting from a recruiter. Um, and I think that definitely um, resonates with me as I think there is an element of, of kind of uh, creating an environment where you're in the right place at the right time. He also talked about his skills. So going to the top of the page now and how that he can apply some of his degree knowledge from economics and economic history um, but not only that, but also using behavioural economics to understand the negotiations and the relationships that go into procurement deals, as well as the stats and the figures. 
and he talks about lots of international travel, which sounded all whilst sounded incredibly glamorous. There's also a not so glamorous side, and that it's definitely a lifestyle choice that isn't always easy. Um, and managing clients is crucial to his role now. And the further up the food chain you get, the more in control of those relationships and the more responsibility for those relationships you're given. And um, he also talked about having an increased interest in politics and you sort of have to when you're working with, with different governments and that he loved the variety of his role too. We talked a lot about emotion as well, about driving you to do a good job and to get the best outcome for your clients. And then the advice here at the bottom kind of summed it up to three key points, which is value your time and move on from roles if you feel like you're not getting the development that you deserve or need and don't have a kind of prescribed view of how long you need to stay somewhere to get promoted. Prioritise your own development over what other people are telling you you should do and also take opportunities when they arise. And I loved what you finished with, Callum, which is I never look back. I might have looked sideways, but I've never looked back. So that is, in a nutshell, what we've been chatting about for the last 50 minutes or so. Amazing. Thank you, Laura. You you capture it all so beautifully. And we've uh, had a, a comment through just to say exactly that, that your illustrations are amazing. And that Callum, thank you. That was so insightful. Um, so thank you once again um, to all of you. We really appreciate you giving up your time. We really appreciate the attendees joining as well. Um, hopefully that gave you a glimpse into another career opportunity, into a different world. Um, and so we'll say goodbye and we'll hope to see you at our final after series, uh, after thoughts event tomorrow with uh, Dr. Rosie Webster. So thank you all once again and uh, take care, everybody. Thanks. Bye bye.